Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for today's Zohu call. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon. I'm Keisha Bohannon, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health Office, welcome to the October 2nd, 2020, 24, sorry, uh, extra 20 there, 2024 Zoonoses and One Health Updates call. Next slide. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one dash health slash php slash trainings dash events slash October dash 2024 dash Zohu call dot html. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify one, identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Two, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Three, identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Four, identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. Five, list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide, please. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all planners and presenters must disclose all financial relationships in any amount with ineligible companies over the previous 24 months, as well as any use of unlabeled or products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners and presenters wish to disclose they have no financial relationships with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial or in-kind support for this activity. Next slide, please. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one dash health slash php slash zohu slash index.html. To receive free CE for today's webcast, sign in or create an account on train.org by November 4th, 2024. The course access code is zohu webcast. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted on our October call page within 30 days. Free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar will be available until November, November 5th, 2026. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Bassler, Deputy Director of CDC's One Health Office will share some news and updates. Thanks, Keisha. Thanks for joining our October Zohu call. Please remember to share the Zohu call website link with your colleagues from public health, agriculture, wildlife, plant, environmental health, and other sectors so we can let them know about the live and recorded webinars and free continuing education that Zohu calls offers. Before we start the presentations, we'd like to share monthly updates and resources. You can find links to these resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you aren't subscribed to the newsletter, please sign up using the link in our main Zohu call webpage so that moving forward, you can get these updates. CDC is working closely with USDA and FDA to monitor the current H5N1 bird flu situation in wild birds and poultry, dairy cows, and other mammals. Today, we're excited to have representatives from all three federal agencies here to share more about the highly pathogenic avian influenza response. 
You can find the latest updates on CDC, USDA, and FDA's websites, including situation updates, recommendations for protective actions for people, confirm, as well as confirmed cases in domestic livestock and more. In, uh, next slide, please. In today's newsletter, we highlight several recent publications, including a Notes from the Field titled Support for Wastewater Monitoring and Influence on Protective Behavioral Interventions Among Adults in the United States, July 2024. Another publication is titled Maternal Exposure to Tap Water Disinfection Byproducts and Risk for Selective uh, Congenital Heart Defects. Next slide, please. Here we've highlighted announcements and resources, including a CDC health advisory on prevention strategies for MPOX, including vaccinating people at risk via sexual exposure for US travelers visiting countries with clade one MPOX outbreaks. Also related to MPOX, we've included a WHO external situation report on the multi-country outbreak of MPOX. Next slide, please. Additional resources we at, for additionally, uh, we've highlighted the Environmental Protection Agency's Septic Smart Education Materials. Next slide, please. And we also highlight the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study Diagnostic webpage on testing and investigations for state and federal wildlife agencies. Next slide. Uh, October observances that may be of interest to uh, call participants include World Animal Day, which is happening on Friday, October 4th, Global Hand Washing Day on October 15th, World Food Day on October 16th, Bat Week, which takes place from October 24th to 31st, and last but not least, Sunday, November 3rd is One Health Day. Next slide, please. Finally, we've shared several new and ongoing outbreak investigation updates, including a number of ongoing salmonella outbreaks listed on this slide, the most recent being an outbreak linked to eggs. There's an ongoing listeria outbreak linked to meats sliced at delis, and an announcement about severe illness potentially associated with consuming Diamond Shrooms brand chocolate bars, cones, and gummies. Next slide. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. You can also find additional details about ongoing U.S. outbreaks in the links from today's newsletter. Our next Zohu call will take place on November 6, 2024. Please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organizations to zohucall at cdc.gov. That's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L -L at cdc.gov. Next slide, and I'll turn the call over to Keisha. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. You may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You may also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide and in today's newsletter. Okay, so we can begin our first presentation. Dr. Eric Diebel will share the first presentation titled, Federal Response to the Emergence of H5N1 in Dairy Cattle. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, Dr. Diebel, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Keisha. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm Eric Diebel. I'm the Deputy Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs uh, at the USDA. Uh, and I have been the agency's uh, principal uh, coordinator for the USDA portion of the response. Very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. My, my goal is to provide a broad overview and sort of give you all the uh, fundamentals of the emergence of H5N1 in dairy cows, uh, both uh, in an effort to make sure that you understand what we know and also to set up uh, Drs. Durand and Bernsteel who will be following uh, with some additional details about their responses on the HHS side. I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we know about the emergence of H5N1 in dairy cows, uh, where it is in the national herd. I'm going to talk about the epi and benchtop work that we've done to better understand it, mention the federal order, uh, talk a little bit about uh, producer supports, uh, and then end on a note of biosecurity as we have ended all of our conversations about H5N1 as biosecurity, particularly enhanced biosecurity, is a key uh, 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 method by which uh, producers uh, can ensure that uh, they uh, remain unaffected by H5N1. Next slide. Am 
All right, I'm still looking at the same slide. Oh, hey, there we go. All right, well, oh my goodness, this is not the slide deck that I had thought that we were gonna be working from today, but that is okay. I will play it by ear. Uh, so we have, since March 25th, 2024, uh, been working uh, at USDA in close partnership uh, with our colleagues at CDC uh, and FDA and OPPR in the White House uh, to address the emergence of H5N1 in dairy cows. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be referring to this as either B313 or Clade 2344B. Uh, this is a unique variant of H5N1 uh, that has a strong affinity for dairy cows, particularly dairy cow memory epithelial cells. Uh, and it is uh, a novel uh, variant uh, that has only recently emerged. Uh, obviously, USDA has been dealing with H5N1 in poultry for a number of years. This particular outbreak dates back to about 2020. Uh, and overall, we've been dealing with HPAI for as long as USDA has been an agency. This slide is a tad out of date. Uh, so I will just mention that we have uh, 14 states uh, and we have just above 240 premises that have been affected at this point. Uh, the only thing that sort of you'll notice if you're following along at home for the uh, uh, reports that USDA is issuing uh, every day on the affected states and counties is that California is not colored in. And in fact, California has a number of herds, uh, and we'll discuss that uh, as we go along. Slide. All right. So. As USDA has gone through uh, this outbreak, uh, we've done a number of different activities uh, highlighted here and particularly noting in which states these have happened. So as a state is known to be affected, uh, and these are very often uh, initial reports from a producer that then submits a sample for testing, which is done at a uh, NAL National Animal Health Laboratory Network Lab and then referred to the NVSL lab to serve as the reference and confirmation lab. Uh, as that process is playing out, uh, USDA and state uh, animal health officials are deploying into the field to have conversations with affected producers to get a better sense about how their, uh, their premise may have been affected. Uh, and so they're using a standard questionnaire uh, and they are uh, ensuring that all of that information flows back into uh, the USDA systems that's getting reported up through the UCG process uh, and shared across all of the federal agencies. Uh, there are a number of states uh, that have uh, voluntary uh, programs in place for producers. Uh, there are a few states that have chosen to implement mandatory testing, uh, most notably uh, Colorado uh, and uh, some portions of Michigan. Uh, and each state has uh, led in these efforts to address uh, the outbreak, uh, depending on the severity and distribution of the outbreak, uh, and to uh, leverage their local assets and relationships with producers to get as much information as they can. USDA has also done a considerable amount of wildlife uh, and sampling of peri-domestic species. Uh, whenever there is a herd that is affected, we have folks that are going out into the field uh, and testing uh, animals outside of the farm. Uh, to get a better sense about what other species may be affected. And of course, whenever a state is interested in getting additional support, uh, we are deploying epi strike teams to help provide some surge capacity uh, for states that are interested in that support. Next slide. All right. So let's talk about the clinical picture. Next. All right. We are somewhat fortunate in that H5N1 in dairy cows, cattle is quite an obvious disease. Uh, it is, uh, it, it moves into a herd uh, and very quickly producers notice a decrease in overall milk production. Uh, and usually there are anywhere between five and 15% of the total herd that is uh, affected and shows significant clinical signs. Uh, 
uh, those animals produce uh, a yellow or uh, a discolored, thickened, caseous type of milk production. Uh, and so uh, they often go off feed and are otherwise not doing well. Uh, this usually persists for about two to three weeks, uh, depending. Uh, and uh, animals that uh, are clinically affected tend to recover well over the subsequent two to four weeks. Um, we are not seeing mortality uh, in dairy cattle in the same way that we do when we see H5N1 in poultry. Uh, H5N1 one is a devastating disease uh, in, in poultry. Uh, we are fortunate that it is a much more mild disease, a transient disease, and one from which uh, cattle in particular tend to recover well. Next slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about what we know about the disease and how we know it. Next. All right. So again, apologies, this is a, a tad out of date because I'm working from a different deck than I had anticipated. But uh, what we have seen uh, through the epidemiological questionnaires that have been used by both the state and USDA officials is that this is a disease that is moving through the distribution of cattle and the transmission by fomites uh, sometimes between farms and very often within farms. Uh, this disease emerged in the panhandle of Texas uh, back in uh, March uh, of this year. Uh, we believe that it jumped over from uh, wild birds to cattle at a single location uh, and then spread throughout a small region uh, and then was distributed to other states out of this region through the movement of cattle. Uh, and then from those, uh, from those initial animals that brought the uh, H5N1 into the states uh, that were initially affected, uh, it then spread uh, within those herds uh, through a variety of different uh, mechanisms. We, we believe that most of it is mediated by exposure to milk, which again, unique to this particular uh, B313 variant, uh, is, is very high levels of virus in animals that are clinically affected. Uh, and then between farms within communities, uh, typically through uh, movement patterns that we have traced back to uh, individuals uh, moving from their farm to their neighbor's farm uh, and shared equipment, uh, including shipping trailers, uh, milk delivery trucks, rendering vehicles, uh, and, uh, and feeding uh, equipment moving between uh, premises. Uh, you can see across the bottom uh, that uh, there are a couple of, of very common uh, findings. Again, uh, cattle being moved uh, or vehicles being used on multiple premises uh, and uh, folks that are uh, using equipment uh, on multiple premises are, are strongly associated with the movement of this disease. Next slide. All right, so we've looked at uh, the epidemiology uh, in the field, uh, and we have all you know, we've pulled together as much of this information uh, as we have, and we've made this available uh, to folks at the USDA website. Uh, and we have also done a considerable amount of benchtop work uh, at our Ames, Iowa facility in order to better understand uh, how this particular uh, variant of the virus uh, affects uh, uh, dairy cattle, uh, where it is present, uh, how uh, from the genomic analysis uh, it may have uh, spilled over and how it has spread. Uh, and we've also worked very hard to uh, establish uh, a good uh, model for uh, vaccine efficacy. Uh, we are wrapping up now the third round of uh, experiments in BSL-3 facilities uh, in order to help us better understand uh, how this uh, disease manifests in animals uh, and how we can address it. 
Also at the bottom of this slide, you'll note that we're, we're also uh, doing ongoing research into food safety. Uh, I'll leave this to my colleagues at FDA to address in milk, but I will mention that we are also uh, sampling uh, beef that is derived from uh, culled dairy cows uh, through our national residue monitoring program uh, to make sure that uh, we have as much visibility into uh, H5N1 in the herd as possible. Uh, to date, we have detected no H5N1 in these samples, uh, but out of an abundance of concern, uh, both for public health, public safety, uh, trading uh, relationships and opportunities, uh, we're going to continue to do this for uh, the foreseeable future. Next slide. All right. So a couple of things that folks often uh, are interested in is uh, the way in which this disease has spread and whether or not, say, the fall migration and birds moving back through the environment pose a risk to dairy cattle in the same way that they do to avian flocks, uh, typically poultry houses. And the answer is, is no. Uh, we have quite definitive uh, evidence uh, that H5N1 is spreading between states through cattle movement, which I mentioned earlier, and then spread between dairies uh, and sometimes uh, uh, within, within dairies and sometimes uh, to other dairies through the movements of individuals and equipment. Um, we don't know everything that we would like to about this disease, and we're continuing to study it as, as vigorously as we can. Uh, we're particularly interested at this point at the manner in which uh, the disease is transmitted from individual cow to uh, individual. Uh, we, we know that it is uh, not respiratory. Uh, we do know that it is associated with milk. Uh, we believe that milking equipment uh, and other environmental surfaces or milking practices are implicated, but it is um, challenging to get uh, the definitive answer that we want. Even as we continue to explore that, we do know uh, the best way to address that, and that is to make sure that folks understand uh, the risk to their herd uh, and are able to implement biosecurity uh, in order to mitigate the risk of the spread. And those are the types of things that, well, you would expect based on the risk factors that we understand. It's limiting non-essential visitors to a uh, facility. It's having a clean and dirty line where folks are cleaning, washing in and out to make sure that they're not bringing the disease onto a farm, or if the disease is present, moving it off the farm. Uh, it's wash stations for vehicles that are moving in and out uh, of facilities and being really cognizant of ways in which uh, you can mitigate risk uh, for those folks who do need to come on a farm to provide veterinary service, to deliver an animal, to uh, uh, pick up milk. Next slide. All right. So uh, unlike uh, poultry producers, uh, dairy cows live outside. Uh, they often live in barns, but those barns are open to the environment. And uh, the type of recommendations that we make uh, for poultry producers don't necessarily fit well to the way in which dairy is produced in this country. Uh, so these are the recommendations that we have been making to folks. And there's a little icon here about the SMS Secure Milk Supply uh, Program. Uh, and that is the sort of uh, basic uh, biosecurity program that most dairy producers are aware of. Uh, we've been working with the folks who maintain SMS as well as the farm program, which is another uh, dairy biosecurity standard uh, to make sure that their guidances are all updated to reflect what we know collectively at USDA, FDA, and CDC, uh, so that folks can best protect their herd uh, themselves, uh, their workers, uh, and their communities. Next slide. Okay. Uh, finally, APHIS response, uh, that's the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, you know what? This is actually all information that is fascinating, but probably not necessary for this group. And again, I'm working from a deck that I did not expect to be working from today. Uh, Keisha, can I ask you to go ahead and hop through 
uh, the arrowed slides with box graphics here. All right. Thank you. So to support producers who've been affected, USDA has done a number of things. We have established uh, a variety of producer supports uh, that provide payments to producers, you know, whether their herds are affected or unaffected, to help them purchase PPE, to help them test their cattle, to help them get veterinary services, uh, to help them with safe milk disposal, uh, and to help them enhance their biosecurity. Uh, we've also instituted a herd status program, uh, and this is a program whereby uh, producers can volunteer to have their animals uh, tested for three consecutive weeks. And assuming they meet uh, the criteria, uh, they are able to uh, ship their cattle uh, without uh, individual uh, testing uh, of those animals. I, I should mention here also uh, a note about the federal order. Shortly after discovering H5N1 had moved into dairy cattle, uh, we uh, initiated a federal order uh, which restricts the movement of lactating dairy cows uh, across state lines. Uh, those animals need to be tested and shown to be negative uh, before they can be moved. Uh, it also requires that all testing uh, be done uh, at a lab that if it's not a, a known lab, uh, that it, the results from a private lab are communicated into the system and that all confirmatory diagnostics has to be done at the NVSL lab. Uh, that gives us a good insight uh, into the distribution of the disease across the landscape uh, and uh, helps to ensure uh, that uh, animals aren't moving without being tested. Uh, that said, states have often gone a bit further uh, and initiated their own quarantines or their own import restrictions against states in which there are uh, known affected herds, uh, which of course you know, doesn't take the place of, of testing, uh, but does help to uh, limit the spread of animals that might potentially be affected. Next slide. All right. This just goes into the details of the herd status program. Uh, the way in which a herd enters to become established is through three weeks of negative testing. Uh, and then there's weekly bulk tank sample testing thereafter. Uh, and then so long as that uh, herd tests negative, they're able to ship in compliance with the federal order without doing individual animal testing or lots of testing for uh, movements of small groups. Next slide. All right. Now, I had mentioned some of the producer supports uh, that USDA is offering. Uh, we have uh, uh, been in dialogue with uh, producers from the very beginning uh, of this uh, emergence, uh, and these are the things that they have asked us for. Uh, as we have moved uh, through the response, uh, we've gained a better understanding and now recognize that there are additional things that producers are, are asking us for. Uh, and so we are in the process now of, of reevaluating those initial rounds of support that we've offered or those initial supports that we have created for folks to see if there are, are groups that have needs that are not adequately being met um, or if we need to add additional resources to the different producer supports. Next slide. And of course, the supports are a little different for herds that are unaffected than those that are affected uh, in as much as they don't need uh, the uh, same level of support for safe milk disposal uh, and similar. Next slide. Okay. Now, I think this is the last slide in this particular deck. Uh, so I'm gonna mention one more thing, and that is that uh, in addition to those producer supports to aid folks who are both affected and unaffected, um, for those folks who uh, do have a herd that is affected by H5N1, we've created an indemnification program uh, to help pay producers for the value of the milk that they are their cattle are not producing uh, to help them uh, 
survive uh, and be sustainable uh, economically as this disease comes into their herd, moves through it, and then is eventually cleared. Uh, so that program is called the ELAP program. It has proven to be very, very popular with producers uh, with very high rates of uptake. And we've pushed out a little over $8.6 million uh, in direct support to, to producers so far. Uh, as we go forward, we're going to continue uh, USDA to collaborate both with our, our state colleagues, our, our FDA and CDC uh, colleagues. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to expand on the dairy herd status program to make it easier for producers to uh, be certain that their herds are, are, are safe uh, and to give them uh, additional biosecurity recommendations and uh, financial support um, so that folks can adopt the practices that we know uh, to help uh, uh, animals be safe. And of course, uh, we are going to continue to work with our CDC and H, uh, FDA colleagues uh, to ensure uh, the safety of the individuals uh, and consumers uh, who rely on our farmers to produce safe, nutritious, and affordable food. All right. I think that's the last slide, Keisha. Am I right? Yes. The next slide is just questions, which we'll do at the end. So thank you so much, Dr. Diebel. And sorry about um, you having to adjust a little bit based on the current, the, these slides. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. All right. So our next presentation um, will be titled Overview of CDC Response to Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza A H5N1. And this will be shared by Dr. Lizette Durand. Please begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. And thank you, Dr. Depot, for the excellent introduction to the H5N1 response. Keisha mentioned, my name is Lizette Durand, and I am the Chief Veterinary Officer for the CDC Influenza Division. I've been working in close collaboration with our USDA and FDA colleagues on the ongoing US government response to high path avian influenza and dairy cattle. Next slide, please. CDC supports the US government response to high path AI and is a lead for human health. CDC is focused on supporting and engaging public health and agricultural partners at the local, state, and federal level, protecting human health and safety by helping states stand up monitoring and testing programs for people working with infected cattle and ensuring that they have the information and resources they need to prevent infection understand the risk to people from H5N1 through epidemiological studies and identifying ways to prevent additional cases. Additionally, CDC is assessing influenza A H5N1 viruses in people and animals for genetic changes that could indicate the virus is adapted and could spread, spread more readily to and among people. Next slide, please. From 2022 through today, there have been 15 human cases of high path H5 reported in the United States. 14 of those have been reported since March of 2024. There have been four human cases of H5N1 in 2024 among dairy workers exposed to infected cows. These cases were reported in three states, Texas, Michigan, and Colorado. Additionally, 10 cases have been associated with poultry exposure nine of which occurred in Colorado in July of this year among workers depopulated in poultry infected with H5N1. Most recently, a case was confirmed in Missouri on September 6, 2024. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services is conducting an investigation into the potential exposure. The patient had multiple underlying medical conditions, was hospitalized, and tested for influenza during their hospital stay. They were treated with oxytamivir. The patient was discharged and has fully recovered. The person did not have occupational exposure to animals or any other known animal exposure. Missouri continues to lead the investigation into this H5 case with technical assistance from CDC in Atlanta. Next slide, please. Now I'd just like to go a little bit more in depth into the Missouri case. As mentioned, Missouri is conducting an investigation into the potential exposure. The case was identified through surveillance testing when a specimen from a hospitalized patient tested positive for flu A, but negative for seasonal flu A virus subtypes. The specimen was forwarded to CDC for confirmatory testing per usual protocols and was confirmed as H5. Again, as mentioned, patient had multiple underlying medical conditions, was hospitalized, tested for flu during the hospital stay, 
treated with osmotomavir and discharged and has fully recovered. The person did not have any occupational exposures to animals. CDC is working with the Missouri Department of Health and Human Ser Senior Services and U.S. government partners to better understand what may have led this person to become infected. H5 outbreaks in cattle have not been reported in Missouri, but outbreaks of H5 have been reported in commercial and backyard poultry flocks in 2024. H5N1 bird flu was has been detected in wild birds in the state in the past. While novel flu cases have been detected through the country's national flu surveillance system, this is the first time that the system has detected a case of H5. Targeted H5 outbreak specific surveillance has been conducted as part of an ongoing animal outbreaks and has identified all the other cases. In this case, the specimen from the patient originally tested positive flu A but negative for seasonal flu A virus subtypes. And this finding triggered additional testing. One household contact of the patient became ill, but similar symptoms on the same day as the case, but was not tested and has since recovered. The simultaneous development of symptoms does not support person to person spread, but suggests a common exposure. Also shared by Missouri, a second close contact of the case, a healthcare worker, developed mild symptoms and tested negative for flu. A 10-day follow-up period has since passed and no additional cases have been found. There is no epidemiologic evidence to support person-to-person -person transmission of H5 at this time. CDC was able to do partial sequencing of the virus in this case, and the H8 gene sequence confirms that the virus is clade 2.3.4.4b, and the NA sequence was confirmed as N1. However, because of low amounts of genetic material, the clinical specimen sequence produced limited data for analysis. The available gene sequences are all closely related to the U.S. dairy cow viruses and similar sequences that have been found in birds and other animals around dairy farms, in raw milk, and in poultry. We hope the further case investigations to provide an understanding of the source of infection. However, it's important to know that there are instances where novel flu case investigations do not identify a clear source of exposure. For example, in the United States, over 500 influenza variant virus cases have been detected since 2010, with 8% having no known direct or indirect exposure to pigs, nor attending an event where pigs are based. Next slide, please. In addition to this virus, when possible, CDC has conducted genetic sequences of the other viruses isolated from the human H5N1 cases. Sequencing results identified H5N1 clade 2.3.4.4b for all cases, which is the same clade, clade that has been circulating widely in wild birds and also detected in poultry and cattle. Importantly, the available current information indicates that current diagnostics are able to detect this virus. There are no known markers for influenza antiviral resistance in this virus, and the virus is closely related to two existing H5N1 candidate vaccine viruses, which can be used to make a vaccine if needed. Next slide, please. CDC is working in collaboration with state and local health departments to monitor people who may have been exposed to H5N1 for signs or symptoms of illness. CDC recommends that all people with direct or close contact to infected animals should be monitored for illness while their exposure is ongoing and for 10 days after their last exposure. Signs and symptoms include feeling feverish, having a fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, body aches. Less common symptoms include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and seizures. CDC has been working with partner organizations and clinicians to stress the importance that if signs or symptoms develop in people who may be exposed to infected animals, people seek medical care to be tested for influenza. State and local health departments are monitoring workers on infected, impacted farms and are facilitating testing and treatment. To date, more than 4,900 people have been monitored as a result of their exposure to infected or potentially infected animals, and at least 240 
people who have developed flu-like symptoms have been tested as part of this targeted situational specific testing. Next slide, please. In addition to active surveillance, CDC maintains comprehensive layered influenza surveillance systems that are a collaborative effort between CDC and its many state and local partners. Surveillance data are collected from a variety of sources to capture flu activity whenever and wherever it is happening. As I mentioned, the Missouri case was identified through the state's seasonal flu surveillance system, while other novel flu cases have been detected to the country's national flu surveillance system. This is the first time that the system has detected a case of H5. Data are collected from public health and clinical laboratories, vital statistics offices, healthcare providers, hospitals, clinics, and emergency departments. These data are reviewed comprehensively each week. CDC is actively looking at these and other systems to monitor for influenza A, H5N1 viruses, including looking for the spread of virus two and among people. As part of the routine public health laboratory monitoring, more than 49,000 specimens have been tested since March using a protocol that would have detected H5N1 and other novel viruses. And other than the Missouri case, no additional cases have been detected. Additionally, no indicators of unusual influenza activity in people, including avian influenza H5N1, have been detected in any of the human influenza surveillance systems. Next slide, please. CDC is also collaborating with state health departments on H5N1 seroprevalence studies to determine if there is asymptomatic infection among people who have worked with sick cows. Seroprevalence studies can help to answer important public health questions about whether there is evidence of asymptomatic infections and what behaviors are associated with greater or lower risk to infection. The Michigan Health Department released negative results from first round of data collection last month. Additional data collection is ongoing. Colorado has completed enrollment in their study and CDC is testing specimens in our lab. Additionally, a CDC team of epidemiologists, veterinarians, and health communication specialists worked with the Ohio Department of Health to conduct a serial survey that will assess past exposures to H5 viruses among a national network of veterinarians and other veterinary professionals. Next slide, please. As I mentioned on the previous slide, CDC collaborated with the Ohio Department of Health at the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, or AABP, annual conference to conduct a serial survey. The study enrolled about 150 attendees who have worked closely with cattle in the past three months. Participants included veterinarians, credentialed veterinary technicians, and veterinary students who practiced in 45 U.S. states. Veterinarians and other veterinary professionals play a key role in implementing a one-half approach to this H5N1 response. Participants completed an online survey about animal exposures, personal protective equipment worn around these animals, seasonal influenza vaccination, and attitudes toward a potential influenza A H5 vaccine, if war one were to be authorized. A trained team of phlebotomists collected blood samples that will be studied to look for antibodies to influenza A H5 viruses, which would indicate a prior infection with H5 CDC epidemiologists will assess associated risk in people whose samples tested positive. They are asked whether, whether the person had respiratory or flu-like symptoms since January of this year, and whether they sought care or received treatment for the illness. The strong collaboration among these three organizations will continue in the coming weeks, including writing up and disseminating the results of this serial survey once available. Next slide, please. These slides show summaries of recent fair animal models CDC has conducted. The first set of studies are the severity and transmission studies. CDC has conducted two different ferret studies to assess disease severity and transmission using viruses from 
two of the human cases associated with dairy cow exposure. The first from the human case in Texas and the second from one of the human cases in Michigan. The study showed that the Michigan virus caused less severe disease in ferrets than the virus from the human case in Texas. While the Texas virus was deadly in all infected ferrets, none of the ferrets infected with the Michigan virus died or had to be euthanized because of severe infection. This finding is important because the Michigan virus is more similar to the currently circulating in viruses than the Texas virus. The genome of the human virus from Michigan did not have the PB2 glutamic acid 627-2 lysine chains detected in the virus from the Texas case, but did have one notable change, the PB2 methionine 631-2 leucine, compared to the Texas case that is known to be associated with viral adaptation to mammalian hosts and which has been detected in 99% of the dairy cow sequences to date. The two viruses are so similar, less than efficient capacity to spread from ferret to ferret by respiratory droplets. The second, study, second set of studies are the ocular exposure studies. These studies demonstrated that what happened when the, when the eyes of ferrets were experimentally exposed to an H5N virus associated with a severe human case identified in March 2023 in Chile. It is related to the virus that is causing the multi-star outbreak of H5N1 in U.S. dairy cattle, but contains some genetic differences in the internal genes of the virus. The study found that the virus experienced severe disease with fever and weight loss. The ferret's nasal specimens contained detectable virus, and the ferrets were able to spread virus to healthy ferrets via direct contact. And after infection, virus is found outside of the respiratory tract, including in the intestinal tract, the central nervous system, as well as the eyes of the ferrets. The findings from these studies highlight the importance for H5N1 viruses to cause infection in people after exposure to virus via the eyes. Tear fluid provides an opportunity for the virus to spread from the eyes to nasal respiratory tract through the tear ducts and vice versa. The findings also underscore the importance of eye protection when working around infected animals or potentially contaminated environments or liquids or surfaces like raw milk. Next slide, please. High path H H5N1 is a one health challenge impacting poultry, dairy cattle, cats, wildlife, and humans. In such scenarios, it is critical to apply a one health approach to the animal the human animal inter and environment interface during responses. Currently, based on the data we have available, the overall risk to the general public remains low. However, people who work who have recreational exposure to H5N1 virus infected animals may be at an increased risk for infection and should follow recommended precautions. People who are exposed should monitor for symptoms after first exposure and for 10 days after last exposure. Testing should be done if a person is exposed, shows symptoms to respiratory illness or conjunctivitis. More detailed guidance is available on CDC's worker guidance on our website. Next slide, please. Finally, CDC has a wide range of resources related to avian influenza on our website. Here are key resources listed on the left, and I encourage you to look at our website for the latest information on what CDC is doing with the data and what the data are telling us about avian influenza in the U.S. and for guidance for public clinicians and public health practice, practitioners and others. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Duran. Okay, next slide, please. In our final presentation, HPA AI H5N1 in dairy cattle, a novel challenge to the milk safety system, will be shared by Dr. Cindy Bernsteel. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. And thank you all for inviting me to speak to you today about high path avian influenza in dairy cattle. My name is Cindy Bernsteel, and I'm the Deputy Director for Drugs and Devices at FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. And I'm the FDA's Deputy Incident Coordinator for the H5N1 response. FDA is the primary federal agency with responsibility for the safety of milk and milk products, and the majority of this update will focus on that. Next slide, please. 
As we get started, I want to highlight four key points. The evidence we have so far demonstrates that the commercial pasteurized milk supply remains safe. As we've not seen this virus in cattle before, more work is needed to understand this emerging pathogen in dairy cattle. FDA recognizes how important it is to stop H5N1 spread in cattle and keep it from spreading to other animals, including humans. FDA is taking a multidisciplinary approach to food safety and medical countermeasures. Next slide, please. As evidenced by the first two speakers, this response requires continued coordination across government agencies, states, jurisdictions, and disciplines to bring this outbreak to a close. It's going to take all of us working together to protect human and animal health. Next slide, please. This is some insight into the federal aspect of the HPAI response. FDA is part of the US government response using the unified command group model where agency leads come together to coordinate plans and operations. The top set of acronyms are some of the US government agencies involved. Within FDA, we established an incident management group to coordinate actions and engagement across the agency. The bottom set of acronyms are some of FDA center and offices that have been involved in this response. Next slide, please. This outbreak in dairy cattle is an issue that bridges agricultural and public health and needs to be addressed at all levels from farm level interventions to sampling retail products. Next slide, please. At the end of June, FDA announced our research agenda. Our agenda provided an overview of FDA's efforts around one, understanding the characteristics of inactivation methods for H5N1 in dairy products, two, ensuring the safety of retail dairy products, and three, One Health interventions to mitigate the impact of this virus. I will speak in more detail on each of these three objectives in this presentation. Next slide, please. For objective one, two of the focus areas are pre-pasteurization milk samples and continuous flow pasteurization studies. This past spring, in order to understand the level of virus in unpasteurized milk that's intended for commercial processing and pasteurization, Researchers tested 275 raw milk samples obtained from multiple farms in four affected states. The sampling was intentionally focused on regions with infected herds, and because of that, these results are not nationally representative. 39 samples were found to have infectious virus with an average concentration of about 3,000 virus particles per milliliter. This information was used to inform the level of virus in milk samples that were then used in the continuous flow pasteurization study. Next slide, please. This pasteurization study, the only one to date designed to simulate commercial milk processing, found that the most commonly used pasteurization time and temperature requirements, named high temperature short time, which is 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds, was completely effective at inactivating H5N1 in milk. From the previous slide, if you'll remember, the average amount of virus load was about 3,000 virus particles per milliliter in milk samples from cows. The milk samples used in this study were spiked with elevated levels of virus, about 5 million virus particles per milliliter, then processed in a high temperature, short time, continuous flow pasteurization system as outlined in this slide. In each of the total of nine repeated experiments, the virus was completely inactivated every time. The results of this study were released in June of 2024. Next slide, please. Completing the pasteurization study was so critical because nearly all of the commercial milk supply that is produced on dairy farms in the United States comes from farms that participate in the grade A milk program and follow the pasteurized milk ordinance. The PMO includes controls that help ensure the safety of dairy products and pasteurization is one of those controls. Next slide, please. Two additional focus areas within the first objective are benchtop thermal inactivation kinetic studies and raw milk cheese aging. So once we had the results in hand from the pasteurization study, we were next looking to explore how sensitive this virus is to different time and temperature combinations. In collaboration with Cornell University, NIHRML, and the University of Georgia, the FDA will determine the effects of various time and temperature combinations on H5N1 viability in fluid milk. In collaboration with Cornell University, the FDA will assess H5N1 inactivation 
under different aged raw milk cheese manufacturing processes. Next slide, please. For our second objective, we wanted to make sure that milk and milk products sold to consumers were safe. To do this, FDA and USDA conducted two retail product sampling studies. Next slide, please. Due to time, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. Um, the first sampling study was 297 samples, um, and those were taken from retail uh, shelves in 17 states. Then in case you weren't aware, milk can be produced at a dairy farm in one state, processed in another state, and then sold in, at yet another state. So the states where the samples were taken doesn't necessarily correlate with the state where the milk was produced or processed. From the, and samples were first screened by quantitative PCR. Any samples that were PCR positive were then inoculated into eggs for virus viability testing. About 80% of the samples were PCR negative, 20% were PCR positive, but none of those samples tested positive for viable virus. Next slide, please. The second retail study was the same design. It was 167 samples. 82.6% of the samples were PCR negative, 17.4% of the samples were PCR positive, but again, none of the samples tested positive for viable virus. Of note in this second retail study is we tested additional milk products, including cheeses, cream cheese, butter, and ice cream, as well as some aged raw milk cheese. All of the aged raw milk cheese samples in this study were PCR negative, so we can't draw any conclusions about whether the aging process is sufficient to inactivate the viable virus from this study. Next slide, please. Our third research objective focused on developing One Health interventions to prevent, control, or eliminate H5N1. Next slide, please. Some of these interventions include the following. In collaboration with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the FDA will explore the development of genome-edited chickens to reduce susceptibility to or provide resistance to H5N1 and other avian viruses. In collaboration with Cornell University, the FDA will investigate practical disposal methods for waste milk. And FDA has partnered with Cornell University, the University of Georgia, and St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital to provide additional capacity for H5N1 virus viability testing if needed. Work is ongoing for sampling milk earlier in production and processing in partnership with our state partners. And understanding that raw milk consumption is a reality for some states, FDA provided some suggested recommendations for those states to try to reduce the risk of raw milk consumption in regard to high path avian influenza. Next slide, please. Um, due to time, I will just show you this slide. These are the recommendations briefly that FDA did provide to the states. Next slide, please. In summary, we've proven that pasteurization inactivates H5N1 in the lab using real world conditions and real world equipment. We've proven through sampling fluid milk and dairy products at retail locations that pasteurization inactivates H5N1 in the real world. Sorry, in the real world. In support of what we know, on September 30th, FDA and USDA co-signed letters to dairy processors and retailers affirming the safety of the commercial milk supply utilizing pasteurization. The planned and ongoing work described earlier in this presentation will fill in the gaps where they currently exist. FDA is committed to sharing the results of our investigations with our regulatory partners, industry, and the public, because it will take all of us working together to end this outbreak. Next slide, please. I've provided a link here to FDA's High Path Avian Influenza webpage that has additional detail on all of our work. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so we are out of time for questions, but I just wanted to thank our presenters. And I also wanted to thank um, the participants for all your questions that I do see have come in. We have captured all your questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer, but if you could go to the next slide. We have um, email shared right here of our presenters. And then on the next slide, we invite you to join our next call in November, uh, on November 6th, a few days after One Health Day on November 3rd. So thank you so much again for participating. And this ends today's call.